Today, I'm gonna to be trying to complete the hardest challenge in Crusader Kings 3 that you've never heard of. Taking this zero development county, where people don't even know what the wheel is, and turning it into a technological mecca with 100 development, by using fascism to achieve what I want. Hello, Ottawans and Ottawans from around the globe. Today, you join us up here in this small county no one has ever heard of before. Chasm? Kazim? Kazam! For sure none of those are right, but whatever. What if I told you this part of the CK3 map was secretly the best territory in the game for playing tall? No, not Rome with the insane starting development, not Kurtuba with the OP buildings, or even Wales with all those lovely, lovely sheep. I'm just kidding, there is no territory better than ones with sheep. But seriously, what if I told you the best territory for playing tall on the whole map was right here? Would you believe me? No? Good, that is the right answer. I think this is the worst start in any Paradox game. So here are the three things you need to play Tall of Crusader Kings 3. Write that down, write that down! You need development to unlock technology and get buildings, which you can then build for boost your gold and development, and then restart that cycle. Very simple. So let's take a look at the development where we're starting. And every single county is zero. Caught. Not only that, but if you take a look at the terrain, it's all taiga terrain. The one special thing about it is that it actually hurts your development by 5%. Nice. Okay, uh, kind of difficult, but he can do that, right? So step two is technology. So you use your developed lands to research new technologies. Looking at our culture here, one innovation is going to take us 61 years to research. All right, again, a little bit challenging, but he's got this. The next step is to use the technology to unlock buildings, which when built will give you a boost to your gold and development. Well, it looks like their religion has sanctity of nature, making it 10% more expensive to build buildings. That's pretty good. And they're in Taiga, so normal buildings you would use to do this, like trade ports and farms and fields, are not available. Not to mention they're tribal. So to get even remotely close to any good buildings, you have to go through all these steps to get to feudal. Oh, this guy just hates himself. I get it now. If you were looking for a terrible start, I've found it right here in Surrogate. Just comparing that to this start in India here, this guy starts with 25 development, he's already feudal, researching text takes 20 years, and he can build some of these tasty, tasty holdings. It's hot. And to make things even worse, we're gonna be starting as Chieftain Borden Gelford. I made him a hideous imbecile because, well, He's our Walmart version of Jordan Belford. So the first thing we want to focus on is switching over to feudalism. We don't even want to think about development. Now, taking a look at the requirements to adopt feudal ways, the hardest one normally to pull off is to organize your faith. Normally, if you're in Europe, you just convert to an organized faith already, <coughs> Catholicism, and get super rich, making it not even a challenge. But in this case, we can't do that because it's so far away. So we'll have to reform it the old fashioned way. Everything else I'll show you how to do and it'll kind of fall into place later. But let's choose a lifestyle. We're gonna go down the learning lifestyle. I'm gonna pick the theology focus. That boost to our piety is gonna be really, really nice. In terms of perks, I'm first gonna pick up profit because it reduces the faith creation and reformation cost, which is going to be incredibly important. In order to reform our religion, I'm going to be making sure we call pilgrimages on a cooldown. So anytime the decision becomes available, we're gonna be locking that bad boy in. We're also going to need to pick up these holy sites. So we need a little bit of military power. So first things first, let's go ahead and try and form this duchy. Now to make sure our army is elite enough, I want to make sure we have full champions here. So you can see we're currently at four of five. Now to max that out, I'm going to go over to my quarters, just people that are living at my court and see different people. So this woman will set her up in a matrilineal marriage by prowess. And this scaly man over here will marry her. He's got 22 prowess. So so they'll get married, and because it's matrilineal, he'll join my court. He'll make an excellent addition to my army. Hello there. And you'll see now that my champions are at 5 of 5, and these dudes we just picked up are at the top of my army. Look, they got 22 prowess, 21 prowess compared to the next guy at 10. So let's go ahead and declare war down here. That should allow us to pretty much clap these guys up. I'll move the guys down here, raise them all, and fire them in. Perfect. So we can go ahead and enforce the demands down here. Beautiful. So to form the duchy, we just need one more county. What we'll do is just declare war against them. Should be a pretty easy clap. They don't have too many guys. Perfect, so we can go ahead and enforce these demands. So currently we are not married. I wonder why, he's so handsome. So I wanna find a good spouse. This young lady is fecund, she would make a good wife. Chance of children's very high, let's go ahead and do that. Hello, wie geht's denn so? We wanna be pumping out the kids really so that we can increase our renown per month and I'll show you why that's important in just a bit. Now Borden over here has a dream. He wants to take this county where they haven't even figured out the wheel. I call it the wheel. One of the worst ideas I've ever heard. 
He wants to transform this territory to a place that values science and technology. A place where all men are equal. An absolute utopia. But in order to do that, we have to first prioritize making money. Hello. And for this life, I'm not even going to put my steward on increased development. I'm going to have him collect taxes. Why? Because we need gold to go on pilgrimages and reform the faith. We need to build the most basic buildings in our holdings. It's going to be pretty important that we just do that to start. Speaking of gold income, the next best thing to do is go on raids. Cool, so we got a quick raid off here. That's good for 15 gold, easy as you like. And uh, we're getting into some battles, which will also give us a little bit of prestige. Now the prestige is nice because I can spend that prestige on men at arms, for example. I specifically like bowmen in this scenario because they get bonuses in taiga. So uh, there's taiga for miles and miles around. So we'll be picking up uh, quite a few bowmen, I think. The more men at arms we buy, the stronger the military we have, which means we can go on more and more raids and get more gold and more prestige, which we can then reinvest. So I'm going to be doing that a lot this life off camera. So with our gold, I'm going to go ahead and buy some markets. Now, the reason I'm prioritizing markets over, say, gathering houses is because markets will give us gold, and it's so much easier to turn gold into prestige than it is to turn prestige into gold. So if I want to call a hunt, for example, my gold will go into the hunt, and then I'll trade that gold for prestige, essentially. Oh, and we had a son in there. Let's take a look at him. Takes after his father. He's slow and homely. Considering we're a hideous imbecile, oh, I'll take that any day of the week. Wow, you're smart. And we can also go ahead and go on our first pilgrimage. I think that's important now, so let's prepare for the journey. We'll hit the site at Perm. And the reason I always pick the longest site to go on is because that will give you the trait Pilgrim. And after returning, we've gained the trait Pilgrim for a 10% boost to our piety. Woo and our wife pulls another kid out of the hat for us. <laughs> so let's take a look. Oh, and he is perfect. He's got no traits. That's actually phenomenal. Okay, so we're sitting at almost 2,000 guys. We do have the ability to betroth our son for an ally. So let's do that down here. And with this new ally, we're gonna go ahead and declare war down here and try and conquer this holy site for us. Perfect, and we grab the valuable hostage on the first go of things. Let's go ahead and enforce the demand. We now have a second holy site in our possession. Now we have to turn our eyes to Perm over here. They look rather menacing. If we declare war for the county, you can see they have 6,000 guys. Nice. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna just try and murder him. Basically, if he dies, he loses all these allies. Hopefully his land splits up. Okay, we got a 61% chance this guy's dead. Let's give it a shot. Bon appetit, my guy. Beautiful. Oh, bro, it must've been something he ate. <laughs> Classic. Now you can see they only have a thousand guys and they're getting warred on. Let's go ahead and declare war. And after taking some holdings, going back and forth and winning a metric ton of battles, we can enforce the demands down here and so be it. Boom, and now we have three holy sites. So I've gone ahead and got our faith ready to reform. I've picked up human sacrifice. This will give us the raid for captive Kazi's belly. Because after we become feudal, we'll no longer have the ability to raid. But with this, we'll be able to constantly declare war, grab some captives, and ransom them back for a massive influx to our goal. Following that, we have medicant preachers, which will allow us to convert counties faster. Basically, we want as many people as possible to be converted to our religion to ultimately support the utopia we're founding. In terms of our doctrines, I've just changed out lay clergy so we can hold our temples, and I've allowed for unrestricted marriage because we want to be breeding in those good, good traits. So let's go ahead and reform this faith. You'll love to see it. And now that we've used our money to found our religion, I'm going to switch my steward over to increase development in our capital. He did his job. He got us enough gold to basically get on our feet and start rolling here. When looking at becoming feudal, he'll kind of be passively increasing the development in our capital. The next longest one to complete is this one. Because we're so undeveloped, we can't research quickly. So the first step to improving this is to become a kingdom. And now that I'm stronger than pretty much everybody around us, thanks to our men-at-arms, I'm just going to pretty much war everybody in my de jure kingdom and come back when we're done. And perfect, we have the entire de jure kingdom, exactly what we want. And we are now a mighty king! Oh -ho -ho. Wow, that is one barren looking court. Where am I? Where's Reznov? What's going on with you? What are you talking about? Okay, so for the rest of my life, the only thing I'm going to be doing essentially is going to all my holdings and upgrading them. And even if I don't own the holding, I'll still be upgrading it because I might hold it in the future. 
Okay, so we've died and we'll be playing as our son here. He's kind of old, so I'm not really gonna do much this life. Just have to keep building tall, making sure everything is maxed out and just waiting for that sweet release of death. Okay, we've died. We're playing as our son, King Borden II Jelford. So for the next part of my plan, I need to be going raiding like crazy, grabbing prisoners, gold, prestige, everything I can possibly get my hands on. I'm also gonna make sure I have host feast and call hunt and go on pilgrimage all on cooldown. We need to be going on these every chance we get. Anytime I have anybody in my prison, I'm just gonna go ahead and execute them and we'll gain 25 piety from that. So I went ahead and made my way on up to profit, which makes faith creation costs cheaper, like we saw before. And because we've been raiding and executing our prisoners, we also have 3,200 piety. Both those things will let me create a new Siberian faith. Now, Borden II over here is not a dumb man like his grandfather. He believed in his ideals of a, a utopian society where all men are equal, but there's no way to create that without someone to manage it. You know, all men will still be equal, all men will have free will, but if we're gonna make this place work, well, we need somebody to be properly investing the money, redistributing the wealth per se. That's why for our new faith here, the only thing that's gonna change is we'll have communion. So if you're rich, you know, you can sin and pay some gold to the head of faith to be absolved of your sins. But we, we need a good leader of the faith and I, I can't really be trusting anybody. So you know what? We're going to be leading the distribution of funds and investment here. We will be the temporal head of faith. Now we need a good name, something good, something direct, something right to the point. The give me money religion. Hello. Christ, if the scientists can do it, we can do it too, right? Our grandfather's dreams slightly changed. You know, we're, we're, we've got a little bit more power, but everybody's still got free will. Everybody's still equal in our kingdom. Just, you know, we just need to redistribute the funds. And as a little aside, this will pair really nicely with medicant preachers because we'll be pushing our religion to as many people as possible and they'll be paying us money every time they sin. I'm also going to switch from the scholarship focus over to the diplomacy tree and the magistry focus. We need to now be maxing out the amount of prestige we have in this life so that we can diverge our culture. Once we can diverge the culture, the culture will only be present in like one of these holdings, maybe two, and that will allow our average development to go from 10 plus 3 plus 3 plus 2 plus 3 to just 10. And that'll be great because the average development of your lands impacts how fast you'll be able to research text. So if our average development is higher, we can knock this one out way quicker. Also, now that we've reformed our religion more than once, we do not need this holding down here at all at all. So what I'm gonna do is I'll just grant it away. Take it. And go. Okay, I finally saved up enough prestige through battles from raids, hunts, and feasts, and now it's time to diverge the culture. I want to pick up a bureaucratic culture because this gives us a development growth of plus 15%. Not only that, but I also want to change out one of my traditions, specifically isolationists over here. I want to change that out for forest wardens. This will allow us to recruit special men at arms units. It'll give the forestry line of buildings additional bonuses. Not only that, but it increases our development growth in Taiga, which is huge and reduces the construction costs in Taiga as well. Perfect. So let's go ahead and diverge this bad boy. Whoa. And then any leftover prestige, I'm going to invest in our men at arms. I can go ahead and now create these special units which have 33 damage and bonuses in Taiga. They're perfect. You'll also see this, that our utopian culture is only prevalent in these two holdings up here. With our average development of our counties being 0.16. Before we reformed our culture, the average development in our counties was 0.06. So now we should be able to get those technologies faster and thus adopt feudal ways faster. Oh, and our son growing up has the choice between patient, generous, and diligent. Now diligent is the best one you could possibly get. Oh, this son is gonna be sick. We have the choice between sadistic, ambitious, or paranoid. Now, if we go with sadistic, you lose stress from like torturing people or executing them, I think. So sadistic is gonna be perfect. He is gonna work out great, this kid. Not only is this a sick pull for us, but it is a fantastic time to actually explain development. Timestamp is on screen if you wanna skip ahead. For every one development in your county, you need 100 development growth points. There are two ways to boost these GP. Actual base increases per month and percentage stacks on top of that. So you take your base increase, multiply it by whatever percentage stack, and bada bing, bada boom, you got your development growth point per month. So if you have one GP and 15% boosts, well, you got 1.15 GP at the end of the month. Clear as mud? Good. 
So how do you get base growth points? Well, that's simple. They only come from a few places. Neighboring counties, special buildings, lifestyle perks, diligently developing the capital, your stewards increased development tasks, and some artifacts, but those are so negligible, I won't even talk about those. So talking about neighboring counties, development radiates outwards from your developed county to all its neighbors at 0.1 per difference in the level. So for example, if you have a county with 10 development next to a county with 15 development, then that'll be going up at 0.5 development growth points per month until it reaches 11. Then it'll go up by 0.4 per month until it kind of fully catches up. This is partially why you might see me move my capital around once per lifetime so that I can make sure all of the counties in this land are benefiting from some form of optimal from neighbor development. Moving on to special buildings. Most special buildings will increase your development. I won't go any further into this because it's pretty obvious where they are. Bruh. In terms of lifestyle perks, you have this one in stewardship called centralization. We'll talk about that in a sec. Next, having the diligent trait is also super important. If you have it, once every five years, you can select this decision to develop the capital, which will give you a raw boost of 0.2 per month. Mind you, this will stress your character the F out. So unless you have a way to mitigate the stress, it's pretty much useless. Finally, talking about our steward, probably the most important one. As we've seen, this man has an increased development in county task. I won't go super into depth in this, but just to say the better this man's stewardship is, the more development growth points they'll provide and the quicker they'll provide it. You can also increase the speed at which they work by picking up this perk. You can also befriend them, which will improve this, but again, we'll cover it later. But the most important thing for the steward that many people completely ignore is his culture. You see, for each era, there's a maximum development you can achieve before taking a penalty. So say we're in the tribal era, I, th I think it's about 10. So if you're at 11 and you put your steward down to increase it, he'll be taking a massive penalty unless you have the tech for that era, in this case it's public works, which will boost it to a max of 20. And every era works like this, but these techs only apply if your steward is part of the culture that knows about these boosts. So if you have a really good steward, but from another culture that doesn't have these perks, well, he'll still be taking a penalty. This is also why you might see me move my capital around if I hit the cap for this era early. It's just more efficient. Okay, so that was for base development growth points. What about those percentages that stack on top of it? Well, simply, there's literally too many to count, and we're going to be abusing that this game. Your religion can have tenants that give you boosts. Your dynasty legacy can give you boosts. The terrain you're sitting on can give you boosts. Cultural ethoses and traditions within can give you boosts. Your court type, your lifestyle and the perks you pick up, random events, artifacts, technologies, and the biggest one that can give you boosts, buildings. So throughout the rest of this video, I'm going to show you exactly how I structured my game to include as many of these as I could. We'll talk about it. All right, and we have died. So we'll be playing as our grandson here, High Shaman Borden the Third. So just to give you a final example and summarize everything we've talked about so far. If I need gold, I'm going to go up the stewardship lifestyle. I'm going to pick up golden obligations, allowing us to demand payments for hooks. Following that, I'm going to pick up it is my domain so I can extort my subjects. This is going to be a huge source of funds for me. Subsequently, when I'm talking about development, I'm always going to be picking up cutting cornerstones to reduce my building costs, professional workforce to reduce the time it takes to build things and finally centralization which gives me a 0.3 development growth in my realm cap subsequently i'm going to flip over to the learning lifestyle i'm always going to be going down the scholarship focus giving us a development growth of plus 15 percent and then i'm going to grab scientific which increases our cultural fascination progress and plant cultivation which increases the efficiency of the increased development in county task if i have diligent i'm also going to think about picking up carefree reducing our stress gain you need those lifestyles every single time. Following that in the innovations, every era here has different texts that do the exact same thing and I'm always going to be picking them up in the same order. There's always one that increases your max development, like this one, Public Works. I'm always going to grab that one first, so I'm never at my cap. Subsequently, there's going to be one that increases your development growth. I'm going to pick that one up next. Now, normally I would grab Moths first, which allows you to upgrade your castles. But in this case, because we have no buildings that will increase our development except for guilds, I'm going to prioritize the tech that allows you to unlock all economic buildings for that era. Following that, I'm going to grab the one that allows you to build all the military buildings for that era. And then I'm going to go about maxing out all of my buildings. Naturally, I'm not even going to waste any time. We're going to go ahead and develop the capital. Now, this is going to stress us out, but don't worry. With calling hunts, we'll lose stress. Same with hosting feasts. And even after that, we have prisoners to execute, which will also lose us stress because we are sadistic. And this is a great example of why I personally like to educate my own kids and choose their traits, because you can get a sick pull if you plan it correctly and get a little bit lucky. 
So we finally saved up enough renown to grab treasured knowledge. I've been saving up for this one because it gives us a 20% boost to our development growth. <laughs> So let's just take a look at our main capital here for a second. Just to show you the actual development, we're making 0.5 monthly growth, plus two from neighbors, plus 0.2 from diligent planning, and treasured knowledge is giving us a plus 20% on top of that. Ha ha! Finally, communion comes in clutch. Uh, so we have our first instance of seeking indulgences. So basically, this kid's been a, a bad boy. You naughty, naughty. But anyways, he'll give us 100 gold for 100 piety. We will accept that every time. And that's gonna come in clutch later down the line when we need tons of gold. All right, so we've hit the year 1026 and we are at a really exciting time. I've been going around and raiding like crazy because when we become feudal, I will no longer have the ability to raid and I wanted to amass as many prisoners as possible so we can ransom them for gold. And this is gonna be incredibly important, right? Because we're tribal, our men at arms are being charged to our prestige. But when we switch over to feudal, our unraised men at arms are going to be switched over to gold. So anybody changing from the tribal era to the feudal era needs to take this into account count or else you're running a massive gold deficit that is next to impossible to get out of. So we're changing from tribal to feudal with a glut of gold, a ton of prisoners in the bank, and all our holdings are pretty much maxed out for the era we are in currently. It's been some time, I got our development up, we were able to research text a little bit faster, and now we can finally adopt feudal ways. Excellent. Now you'll notice that our monthly taxes went down to negative 6.6 .6 because our men at arms are are now being charged to gold. You'll also notice that there were some temples created as well as cities created in some of our holdings. The next thing I wanna spend my gold on is I wanna make sure I'm buying our special buildings, specifically this grand temple over here, which will give us a boost to our gold, a boost to our levies, holding taxes, development growth, all really good stuff. I'm also going to found this holy order. Now we couldn't do this before because we had no temples or cities to grant to our holy order. So another thing to think about is all this territory is absolutely tragic. Take a look at all the buildings, right? None of these buildings, until like level 7, which is already way too late, provide any kind of development growth. The only places that provide development growth are here in cities, we have guilds, which provide exponential amounts of development growth for every level they're upgraded. So before I create my holy order and grant them this territory, I'm going to purchase guilds, because once they're in, you can't buy any buildings. So now let's go ahead and found this holy order. Now holy orders are great, not only can we use them to fight in our wars or our religious wars, but they're also going to pay us gold to lease these places out later on, so that's going to be incredibly clutch. With my remaining gold, I'm just going to go around and buy any buildings that'll give us more gold per month. And here we go, our holy order wants this other city now, and they'll give us 225 gold for literally doing nothing, which I'll then flip back into my holdings. So we came in, we started investing in our buildings, and just a few years later, we're already in the positives in terms of gold. So in every holding, I'm gonna wanna make sure that I have one barony, one temple, and then one city. And if a city doesn't exist, I'll go ahead and build it. And this is simply for the reason that we can build guilds in these cities and increase the development. So I just picked up a golden obligations, which gives us the ability to demand payments for hooks. And with that, I'm gonna come over to my council here and have my spy master try and find secrets. And any secrets he finds, I should be able to convert into hooks. And with those hooks, demand payments from them. So here we learned of this man's cannibal secret. I'm going to come over to my hooks and secrets and I'm going to blackmail him for a hook. So I gained a blackmail hook on him and I'll come over to him now and I can actually go ahead and demand payments and he'll pay me 50 gold. I literally did nothing but willed 50 gold into existence just like that. We're going to keep repeating this process over and over and over with our spy master and then just flip that gold into buildings for the rest of our life. Huh? What's this? Ah, oh, man, I got to do it to you. I'm so sorry. I got I got a hook on you. I have to extort you and you're now legally obligated to like and subscribe. It's not that these likes and subscriptions help me out at all or just give me the will to live. It's a legal requirement. There's nothing I can do. I don't make the rules. I just think them up and write them down. Okay, anyways, back to the video. <laughs> the other thing that I always forget to do is come over to my royal court and take a look at my court grandeur. Now you'll see that by default, we are a tribal court. 
but being an administrative court is much more conducive to playing tall. You'll see it'll reduce the building construction time, building construction costs, and as soon as we hit level 7, it'll increase the development in our realm capital, which is going to be great. So let's change this court type and then boost up all of our court amenities so that we could get to level 7 and increase our development in our realm capital. <gasps> And we've died. Perfect. We'll be playing as young boarded Jelford the fourth. I'm gonna look at developing the capital. Now, if you take a look at Borden Jelford, he's calm, diligent, and generous. Now, one of the ways to lose stress as somebody who is generous is by giving away money. So, what I'm gonna do is make sure we're paused. I'll develop the capital. That'll cause me to go over my limit in stress. So, I found this count down here, and we could send her a gift to lower our stress. Same thing with this guy over here. He only wants 25 gold. And it's kind of rough. We didn't go under the limit, but we got pretty close. You get the point. All right, so this life has been incredibly boring, which is why I probably cut most of it out. All we've been doing is focusing on increasing our development and then reinvesting our gold anytime we had a chance. The next thing I'm going to do is actually come on over to my culture here and reform it. And I'm specifically going to add pacifists. What this will do is increase my development growth by 10%. Okay, finally we've died. We're playing as a uh, high shaman John down here. So again, this son is also diligent. If you look, I had three sons and one of them wound up being diligent. So three has been my, my solid number for kids. So I just noticed that our development for this county over here is 17, probably the highest in our entire realm. But looking at our culture, our culture is not even benefiting. Oh, well, mistakes have been made, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm gonna go have my steward over here. What is it? Hold on a sec. This guy is a drunk club-footed boy. You know, when my father and his father's father set out on this empire, we said one thing. We need to be focusing on stewardship and learning to make this utopia. There's no time for any drunk freeloaders here. So, you know what? We'll put them on promoting our culture, but we'll definitely have to change them out for somebody better. I think our kingdom here needs a little rebranding just to make sure people know we, we want to focus on science and technology and learning. Now, when Whenever I think of a country and people that love technology, I think of Korea. Because in Civ 6, you get all kinds of crazy science bonuses when you play as Korea. That's why I'm gonna call this new kingdom, New Korea. Perfect, New Korea right there. Hopefully that'll instill our values back into our people without having to take any drastic measures. Okay, finally we've died, now we're playing as our son, Borden the Fifth. Okay, well, uh, New Korea's doing not so bad. Let's pick up a new dynasty. I'm gonna grab power and prosperity because that'll increase my monthly stewardship lifestyle experience. So this life, I've been doing the normal things. Going around, raiding for captives, ransoming people off, extorting people, demanding payments for hooks, investing in our buildings, all that great stuff. But I've also moved my capital up here and just been developing it like crazy. And if you take a peek, the development of our county is going way up super high because we have this guy with 20 stewardship as our steward. Now, the only way to make him better would be to befriend him. When you have friends as your steward, it gives them a plus 20% percent to whatever activity they're doing. I'm gonna flip over to diplomacy, grab befriend, and then start befriending my steward. Okay, so a bit of time has passed and we were able to befriend him. You'll see because he's our friend here, he gets a plus 0.72 to his modifier, so that's really good. We've also been saving up our prestige, allowing us to reform our culture. And I'm specifically gonna grab a philosopher culture. Why would I do this? Well, learning education traits in the scholar trait also gets bonuses to their cultural fascination progress. It also increases our learning per level of fame, as well as our learning lifestyle experience. So, so all these things are absolutely phenomenal. It's been an absolute slog of a life. Just going around and buying, 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 buying holdings. That's it. That's all we've been doing. Something you'll notice I did is as soon as I got manorialism, I invested in all of my cities and got them up to tier 2 cities. Following that, I always upgraded my guild buildings first, making sure they're as high as they possibly can. In most of my holdings right now, we have a tier 2 city and a tier 4 guild building. 
Now I've also gone around to any duchy capitals I hold and picked up royal preserves. Not only will this increase the tax in my holding, but it also increases my development growth, which is what we're gonna need to stack here. You can see we're slightly, well, we're not slightly, we're a lot more yellow than some of our neighbors over here. Look, everybody's smelly over here, except for us. We're good yellow boys. Child of my dynasty, oh my god. This is what nightmares are made of. Look at this fucking guy, bro. Ah, oh, who is this? My grandson. Kaylee, and he's got the pox. Sheesh. Oh, and perfect. We just died. What the heck is this, bro? As the ruler of the universe, it's inevitable that you will bow to me. Bro, who is this guy? Holy shit, how did he have 36,000 dudes? Ah, it's the great Mongols. Go to say, you pose no threat to me. I don't have to beat them outright. You just have to defend against them long enough to where it's too painful for them to continue. That's how a lot of wars have been won in the past. <laughs> Vietnam. Oh, <laughs> Only 5,000 guys over here. Let's uh, link all the boys together. They went right for my main holding, but if we can catch him here, we should be all right. And I took an arrow in the knee. Oh, perfect. We got another half of them, and that puts us at 100% war score. So that's all we need to enforce the demands, and he'll give us 800 gold for that. Beautiful. Look at these boys. They're huge, actually. But New Korea stands strong, stands tall, and stands united. Okay, so finally, we've died as this character, and we're playing as our daughter here, Utyaka. Now, this daughter is amazing because she is diligent. And why am I saying that? Well, if you take a look at your possible court positions when you are a lady, you get two ladies in waiting, which reduce your stress by 10 to 20%. We'll lock in two ladies in waiting. We'll make sure they like us because they are powerful agents in hostile schemes against us. Let's lock her in. And our cousin. She's also excellent. So this 1.5 gold per month is going to be huge for us. Now we need to make sure that we have developed capital pretty much on cooldown. So talk to Yuck Tuck over here. She's one badass woman. And she knows this Mongol horde next to her is not gonna let up for anything in the world. Now, she can't just let the people run willy-nilly. There needs to be a little more structure with such a looming threat right on her doorstep. And you know, in our empire, we've established this. All men are created equal, but some might be a little more equal than others. And we're gonna actually have to pass some high crown authority just to make sure that we have a little bit of a tighter hold. It's also gonna be quite important. We modify our vassals contract and make sure they're giving us high taxes. This is an act of tyranny, but what are you going to do about it? I have 20,000 guys, almost every building maxed out, and incredible men at arms. You can't do anything. Besides, it's for your own good. Don't worry about it. Ah, oh, the joys of playing tall and being able to impose your will on your vassals. We might as well rebrand at the same time and make sure everybody's on the same page. So the kingdom of New Korea was good, but you know, we need something snappier, something shorter. Perfect. Now I can assure my people's safety and really defend us from those pesky Mongols. The last few lives have been rather quick, but in every single one of my cities, I've got them up to a tier three city with a level six guild. And the year is 1220. Our average development in Utopian culture counties is 0.6, which is phenomenal. And if you take a look at our capital here, we are at 31 development, but growing at a rate of 9.3. That's just stupid. We're getting 0.8 from neighbors. The developing county, which is our steward developing it, is giving us 4.9. We do have a penalty from existing development, but diligent planning, centralization, and our court type are also giving us bonuses and then we have all of these percentage bonuses that are just stacking honestly it's kind of nutty i won't even go through them all this city is looking good and uh, we got about 7,000 prestige. Now I'm looking to reform my culture yet again. Now I think I'm gonna go with collective lands here. Although it does increase building construction time, it will also increase the development growth. So let's lock that in. I like that. On another note, the Han Empire has completely broken up. These Mongols had a rough go of things, but things have been going really well since I completely took control of Korea here. You know, everybody's eaten. We're making 77 gold per month. 
Our court is one of the fifth most ranked courts in the world. Almost every building is completely maxed out to where we can be right now. You know, the more and more authoritarian power I take, the better and better it's been going. Yuck to Tic Tac here has been doing a phenomenal job as Supreme Ruler. Yeah, so I gotta say, it's not the most riveting gameplay. Anytime I can, I'm just developing the capital. I've just got my steward sitting here developing the capital. I'm always making sure that my steward is the best possible one I can get. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we have currently hit 62 development in this territory. And if you just take a peek at Rome, they are at 50 seven so we have surpassed rome in terms of development the next person we've got to catch up to is constantinople over here he's at 64 so for my army i just picked up a bunch of different random men at arms units i know it's not the most optimal way to play it but who cares different units are getting bonuses from the buildings i've built so all my armored footmen are getting insane bonuses from the barracks i've built and all my special bowmen units are getting insane bonuses from the forestries i've built now i'm just gonna use my gold to max them all out and really solidify my grasp on the land and as our religion grows, so do these seek indulgence pop-ups. These guys are coming hot and heavy, really just padding our bank account. If you take a look, uh, the money grubbers are taking over down here. We're, they're, they're flying, all right. Okay, so the year is 1305. I'm now playing as this dude down here, and I've been doing nothing but unlocking techs and upgrading my buildings. As you can see, we're making just stupid gold from each of the holdings. 12 gold, 13 gold, 10 gold. I just want to get everything up to similar to where this temple is. I have a level 8 gamekeeper's lodge. So hunting grounds, level 8, gives you 2% development growth. Forestry, level 8, gives you 2% development growth. I'm gonna go ahead and reform my culture one more time and just add another tradition it's called family business and the reason being is base progress and skill impact on counselors task is increased by 10% for close family members I have no shortage of good stewards in my line in our snowy capital just in general we're currently sitting at 83 development Borden and Jelford the sixth over here noticed something he noticed he still had some room for some holdings so who the hell needs a pesky vassal when you have room for more holdings so what I'm gonna do is is just revoke this man's titles and have him rise up against me. And he does not stand a chance. We're about to clap him up with our elite units. Where are you going? <laughs> wow, that was easy. Oh, perfect. And easy as you like. Now we can enforce our demands and just revoke all of these guys' Yoink. titles. North Korea reigns supreme. I'm New Korea reigns supreme. So uh, let's just take a look at the character finder. All of the characters in the world. And we'll sort by military strength. Well, look at this. We seem to be second in the world only to King Hans the Bully. He's got 50,000 dudes. I am supreme leader. Not this man. We need to take him out. I'm going to make my way on over to him. Oh, and as we die and play as our son here... You can see that we have 99 development in our barity. There's only one thing left to do, and that's to avenge our father. We are going to take this man's capital and become the most powerful man on the planet. Oh, it's beautiful. Let's go ahead and declare war for our claims down here. Oh my days. All the boys are coming together here. This could be a rough shout. Let's get them all linked up. Oh, and look at them all. They're all running on low on supply. Oh my days. I actually think we have enough average supply now that we could just bomb rush it to the capital. Beautiful and easy as you like. Taking the capital gives us enough war score to enforce the Nevads. Now in the character finder, we reign supreme. With a hundred development in the capital. From a lowly count to a complete autocrat, we absolutely killed it. I just want to say a huge thank you. If you have a tougher tall challenge, please leave it in the comments. I'd love to give it a try. Also, if you have any save my disaster files or just incredibly sick empires you've built, I'd love to see the save file. You can always email them to me with the subject line, CK3 save file, or else I won't open it. Finally, from Borden, from me to you, thanks for watching. And if I don't see you, good afternoon. Good evening and good night. The Ottawa Welshman, the CK3 man, I'm the king of this land. If you want renown, well, I got it. The way I run my house, you know you want it. 
got a thousand sons, all named John. They probably don't know that their cousin is the mom. Tutorials played through speed runs to win. No challenge too great for the Ottawa Welshman.